We are raised to believe that the God Emperor watches over us all. We are his sword. We are his wrath. In battle, he offers us redemption. And for those who prove worthy, the Emperor sends forth his angels. Today we're going to find out everything we don't already know about Stellaris Galactic Paragons. We're going to find out about the eight, or is it 12, new civics we'll be getting, the brand new origin, and the two tradition trees. So stick around and let's dive in. Marek from Paradox Arctic has returned to show us through the new civics, origins, and traditions. As you may have guessed from a lot of the other content we've seen so far, the civics are focused on leaders, but not always. During the developers' design run on the potential civics, they had to take into account a few different things. They should focus on civics, effects, and modifiers targeting leaders in some way. They also wanted to add new ways for players to play their empire, and they needed to remember to strengthen the fantasy for certain playstyles that are still not present within the game. And I've looked ahead, ladies and gentlemen, there are some very spicy civics that are amazing from a roleplay perspective that have deep impact on the game that we're going to look at in a moment. So what did they decide to do from that list? Well, they decided to do everything. Instead of being content with just creating one or two civics per empire type, they ended up with eight unique civics, if you count copies of civics, which are just an adjusted version for different empire types, that number rises to 12. So we are actually getting 12 new civics coming with Stellaris Galactic Paragons. That's a lot of civics. Sprinkled around standard empires, megacorps, hive minds, and machine intelligences. The first new civic we're going to look at is probably the most iconic new civic for Stellaris Galactic Paragons. It's called Vaults of Knowledge. This one allows you to store the knowledge of your leaders to enhance your future leaders. To sum it up a bit, every leader who manages to survive up to level 8 will give a bonus to the unique building provided by the civic where the story, experience or knowledge of this leader will be stored for future generations. The flavor text reads, the knowledge, principles, and experiences of exceptional people are digitized and accumulated in the vaults of knowledge. Citizens can access this source of wisdom and experience to learn from the ghosts of the past. Leaders will start with a plus one level, which is good, and you get to build the unique vaults of knowledge building. Vaults of knowledge produce unity and increase leader experience gain based on destiny traits acquired meaning that your leaders will level up faster, giving you more bonuses across the Empire. We don't yet know how impactful leaders will be in the game after this rework, but given it's the focus of this DLC, it's probably a safe bet to assume this might be quite powerful if you take it in the mid-game. In this next Civic, the developers decided to make something which would showcase some of the more fancy traits as soon as possible. But Marek also wanted to play an empire which embarks on a holy war to turn everyone into a proper clone of his ethics. This is a very roleplay friendly civic. This is a war civic which, unlike most war type civics we have, is not useful for expansionist conquer everything empires. The entire idea around crusader spirit is not being religious, hence you don't need to be spiritualist in order to take it, but more a fanatic towards proselytizing your ethos to others. After all, they were converting people to their moral values on their planet, why would they stop doing that when they got into space? The lack of guidance creates weak minds, which easily succumb to corruption and plunge into decadence. This society has assumed the self-imposed mantle of bringing enlightenment to the masses through aggressive proselytizing. The effects. Admirals start with the Zealot trait. I've got no idea what that does, but it sounds pretty good. Generals start with the Crusader trait. You are locked into only using the Liberation War policy, which is very interesting. Ship weapons damage gets plus 5% and ship build cost gets a tasty minus 5%. Additionally, you get a special council position which is called Lord Commander. 
the Empire effects per skill level are plus 1% fire rate and plus 2% army damage. At level 10 that will scale up to plus 10 and plus 20% fire rate and army damage respectively. The Zealot trait is one of Marek's favourite veteran traits and it's the only reason he made this civic. So you will get it on every admiral, the above is just an excuse. But what about the profits I hear you ask? Well let's not forget about those players who like to play Megacorp, as the developers also have something fancy for them. Megacorp themes are usually centred around dystopian corporations running the country, either at the forefront or from the shadows. Here the developers wanted to add a new brick to this player fantasy which they felt was lacking. And this is how Farm Estate was made, giving a boost to medical workers and also unlocking a new corporate building for your fancy branch offices. Be it an illicit place making people go bankrupt by providing aesthetic surgeries for credit, or a company focused on making lives better, with a hefty profit margin of course. The choice is yours to take. A strong nation is a healthy nation. This mega corporation maintains a robust economy through experimental drugs, highly privatised clinics and aggressive marketing campaigns. Medical workers will produce an additional 2 amenities and 4 trade value. You can build the corporate clinic corporate building and your leader lifespan goes up by 10 years. Those additional amenity outputs along with the trade value may actually make medical workers rather nice to put down on your planets. Probably not your trading planets as you don't really need to buff the habitability there, but on planets where you're wanting to build alloys or possibly some science or something like that as a trade based megacore. Additionally, you will unlock the Pharmaceutical Executive Council position, which grants plus 1% pop growth speed and plus 1% habitability empire wide per skill level of the councillor. And there's a fun little bit of flavour text down here by Marek that says, We just invented new ways of preventing coughing. Instead of the standard 7 day treatment it will take only 1 week to get rid of it, so definitely worth the 50% increase in price. Profits are however not everything I'm being told. The efficiency of the processes is also critical for any mega corporation's success. Inefficient work can lead to serious mismanagement, loss of profit, well so there is the profit part again, and a potential loss of worker of the month status. After all, you're not just a cog in the machine, you are a very precise cog which keeps the company afloat. Enter Precision Cogs. This mega corporation operates on a highly optimised and robust system of delegation. Such an approach means that a given task is always performed by the most qualified worker. Plus one leader capacity, minus 20% leader upkeep, which now that the unity costs are much higher for our leaders that's probably a lot better, and leader maximum negative traits minus one. You'll also unlock the council position of chief posting officer, granting an empire wide effect per skill level of plus 1% specialist happiness and a whopping plus 5% specialist political power. I'm not entirely sure, unless you're an authoritarian empire or something along those lines, why you'd really want to buff your specialist that much, but hey ho, maybe it's got some uses that I haven't quite thought of yet. In essence, the superb organisation skills of this megacorp allow it to hire more cogs, I mean leaders. And if you're enjoying this video please, become a precision cog in the system and delegate that like button. But what about guest out empires, what about hive minds and what about machines? So far we've seen that they have been pretty much completely left out of the new paragon feature, you cannot get any paragons that are focused on machine empires or hive minds which is a shame, and from the developers own words here they've said that in a way guest outs are the opposite of galactic paragons DLC which is centred around individuals, their growth and path to glory, power, wealth or just levels. If you are a guest out main I can imagine you're feeling something like this at the moment. Let me in. Let me in. But don't worry there are two new civics specifically tailored to guest out empires. These should apparently make your leaders feel a bit more individual compared to other guest outs. Both hive minds and machine intelligences with these civics will give more freedom of thought to their leaders, allowing them to focus their consciousness on different matters, which should also help a bit with leader unity upkeep 
For machine empires, that's something we've been flagging for a little while, going, ooh, this new high unity upkeep for machines may be a massive problem. But don't worry, as the base change will make you go from two unity per level down to just one unity per level of upkeep, which is effectively a 50% leader upkeep reduction. This should allow you to hire more leaders to get more resources, and basically you're delegating by consuming more nutrients. Autonomous Drones changes one base unity per leader upkeep into two minerals or two food, depending on whether or not you're a regular hive mind or a lithoid. That's quite a helpful unity reduction. The hypermetabolic drones evolved in this colony possess increased autonomy. While decision making and situation assessment are enhanced, these drones require an increased intake of digestible materials. Machine Empires get Sovereign Circuits, which does basically the same thing, but instead of food, you're now going to be paying energy credits. Of course, a staple for machines. Units produced by this machine intelligence come equipped with autonomous decision-making software, more efficient and effective than older models. These units nevertheless require greater power input. So I think that these civics are going to be somewhat useful in the early game, but later on when you're making lots and lots of unity, you'll probably swap them out for something more relevant. But that's not eight civics we cry. Well, the developers think it can be fun to speculate or explore the civics by ourselves. They've left us some teasers about the missing ones. There is no reward for guessing the civic and its effect, but you can always brag about it if you write down in the comments down below what your prediction is and then it turns out to be true. First off, can we spot what is wrong with this planet? And no, Marek is not asking about the aristocratic elite civic building that he has on this capital world. Yes, we know it might be a bit silly, but that is not the question. So let's try to have a look. The first thing that jumps out to me is that it claims to be an Ecumenopolis world, but it clearly is still an ocean type. Now I've seen in game if you console command a terraform, sometimes the picture does not update until you reload the save. However, I don't think that would be something that they would overlook when trying to show us a what's wrong here. Perhaps we're going to be getting a civic that allows us to put down Ecumenopolis buildings on a planet without actually converting it into an Ecumenopolis. Maybe that's only possible on our capital, maybe that's the limitation, but oh boy, that would still be really, really powerful if we could take that as a civic rather than having to invest in a full-on Ecumenopolis. The other things I notice is that this planet is producing 262 unity. It only has, let's see, it has some politician and aristocrat jobs. It also has a whole bunch of police, a whole bunch of enforcers that should produce a bit of extra unity and there is also the comms relay building, so together that might equal 262, but I would think it would be a little bit lower given we've only got, what, five or six dedicated jobs to it, the politician jobs producing a little bit, and then of course the enforcers producing one unity apiece. Although these days, don't they actually make stability? Or I might be missing that up with a different uh, civic. Anyway, that could be the problem. Additionally, they're only taking 80 consumer goods in upkeep here for 232 pops, plus all of the jobs that are going to be taking up consumer goods as well. So the consumer good expenses seem low, the unity seems possibly a little high, but, but not very much. And of course, there's that whopping issue where we are seeing a water planet and a, a, an ocean world instead of the Ecumenopolis graphic. What do you think is going on? Let me know down in the comments below. Future Montu here. Now, the one thing I missed in all of that was the number of enforcers. I saw the high number of pops and I thought, yeah, that probably looks pretty reasonable. I don't see why not. However, it wasn't. This, we now know, thanks to a live stream yesterday, is the oppressive autocracy civic. Only the elite of the elite deserve the best of the best. Everyone else is expected to provide for the ruling class and their lackeys. This has some really interesting effects, and it's very, very roleplay friendly. It forces the dystopian society living standard under which non-ruler pops have decreased consumer goods upkeeps. However, 
only ruler jobs and enforcers have amenities upkeep, so you don't need to produce very amenities to keep your entire population happy. That's a very wild playstyle change. Most pops now generate one additional crime, however, so crime can be a real issue. Only ruler jobs can produce amenities. You are forbidden, and I really mean verboten, from building hollow theaters. Leader capacity goes up by plus one, and you get minus 20% leader upkeep. This still is part of the leader focus civics of the new patch, and we also get to see the council position. Primary Overseer gives you per leader skill level that it has this councillor position, plus 1% ruler happiness, and plus 0.2 unity from enforcers. So there was definitely an increase of unity on that planet we looked at due to the enforcers. I knew it. And here are some more civics in no particular order. These are Letters of Mark, Neural Vaults, and Heroic Past. However, we don't know which icon goes with which name. I'm assuming the Letters of Mark is the letter. Heroic Past possibly is the middle one. And then Neural Vaults is the left one, but that wouldn't really make sense. I mean, that, that middle one, I, I can't really see how that's heroic. It's kind of like a present robot thing. Um, definitely a little confused right there, but I don't know. Wh which ones do you think is which? Well, we also have some descriptions for these. Heroic Past puts the Empire into something like legendary or heroic figure worship, which is focused on creating better leaders faster than other empires. Taking this civic, the Empire shows that it is dedicated to growing their citizens into exceptional individuals who will lead it to a great future, or to die just like anyone else if they enter a system containing the Aether Drake by accident. We do not promise that your leaders will actually survive to become true legends. I'm assuming this civic is basically going to increase our leader experience gain, possibly reduce the time between levels or something like that. Letters of Mark is of course all about privateering. It is Paradox's take on the fantasy around pirates working for a big megacorp, helping them in dealing with anything which requires firepower. Why spend money on fighting piracy when you can spend money on hiring pirates to do your bidding, be it raiding your neighbours or keeping other pirates in check? I assume this has something to do with the mercenary system, but there might be some more interactions around it, and hopefully some special interactions with the Marauders as well. The Neural Vault Civic is an adjusted version of Vaults of Knowledge, but instead for guessed out empires. This allows you to extract memories from efficient drones, and then use these memories to create more powerful leaders. We don't actually have screenshots for any of these civics I've just gone through, as Marek didn't want to overload the dev diary with too many pictures. And yes, he knows that we can guess which one is the Megacorp Civic by its color. I think we've got some really interesting civics coming with this next DLC. I'm particularly excited to try out Crusader Spirit from a roleplay perspective and to find out more about that darn Ecumenopolis world and what on earth was going on there. Now let's find out about the unique origin coming with Stellaris Galactic Paragons. We're going to have one ruler to rule them all. Under one rule is a semi-story origin, with a lot of different outcomes based on the Empire composition and your in-game choices. If someone asked what the inspiration was, Marek would say a certain person from the Invincible series, his name starts with an O, and some historical characters like Charlemagne. I think this could be, in some ways, very, very similar to an Injustice style universe, where a leader basically unites the world under their authoritarian rule. I'm guessing you have to be some level of authoritarian to take this origin, though possibly not. There is also one possible stylistic reference here that I think if the mechanics back that up would be absolutely fantastic for a lot of players, and that is if this could be a God Emperor of Mankind style origin. We already get, or we're going to see how we're already going to get increased leader lifespan and increased bonuses. This, if it is a God Emperor origin, would be something players have been asking for for a very long time. 
The main theme is about an empire interconnected with an exceptional individual who, instead of unifying peacefully, unified the planet by, ahem, other means. Imagine the New World Order first contact event, but at a later date with a ruler who actually succeeded in staying in power. This exceptional leader is the luminary of the empire, the one who brought the new age, and promised the glory of the stars to his or her people or it. I guess you get it by now, oh my goodness me, the fact they mention or it means I think we can actually take this as a guest out consciousness empire, which means it's not an origin only for regular normie biological empires, but machines and hives can take it too. Amidst violence and hardship, this civilization was unified by a single leader. Consolidating power through the repression of weaker factions, they have now become a fierce advocate for science and technological advancement. In the aftermath, an uneasy peace has descended, but peace rarely lasts. As the developers only had time to do one origin, they decided to follow the more story-like approach, but they tried not to go the way of the story story only origin. It's more of a road of the luminary leader to fulfill their destiny, which is in the player's hands. There are four or more, depending on how you count it, different outcomes based on the player's choices, with a special route which Marek used to call the I don't care about the story that much route, which bypasses a lot of story content by also bypassing a lot of potential power gains. So if you want the power, you're going to have to do the story. Now apparently this origin requires that you have dictatorial. That would conflict with the earlier comment made about it, which would imply we could be guest out. So perhaps actually this origin is not something that guest out empires can take, unfortunately. But anyway, if you're baffled why you can't be imperial with this origin, as every story goes down its own path, there are apparently possibilities in game to pursue different goals than staying true to the founding mythology. Yes, this does mean that there are events which allow you to change the authority type of your empire, and Marek is not afraid to spoil them as they happen fairly quickly. Basically, one of the big bonuses here is going to be that your leader gets the luminary trait. This is a destiny trait that first off gives them plus 40 years of leader lifespan, so they hopefully won't die on you, and then also has a massive effect as a counselor. You will get plus one and a half stability and plus 3% unity from jobs empire wide with this. So if your leader starts at level one, you're getting only one and a half stability, sure. But as you go up to level 10, that is 15 extra stability empire wide and a whopping 30% additional unity from jobs. And apparently this isn't even his final form. To look at the more mechanical aspects of course, this new origin is going to take use of the new ruler creator feature we're going to be getting in the Empire creation screen. The main feature of the origin is to give the player a strong starting ruler with a unique set of powerful starting council traits. All can be tiered up to tier 3, so there is room for your leader to grow. These traits, in opposition to standard council traits, are not based on leader class, but instead on Empire ethics. To keep it short, there are 14 traits you can choose from. We can see a few of them here. Gunboat Diplomat, this leader favors displays of power. A well-placed threat is sometimes worth, I'm going to say a thousand words. Brain Poacher, by offering the best, we can attract the brightest minds. This leader specializes in brain drain. Autark, oh goodness me. This leader will strive to ensure the nation's self-sufficiency. Thank goodness you can now have an autarky leader in Stellaris. Okay, moving swiftly on to Gumboat Diplomat. This will, on top of the fact you'll have that luminary trait, don't forget, give you plus 10% diplomatic weight from fleet power as a counselor effect and plus 0.25 max influence from power projection, along with a minus 5% to ship upkeep, which is pretty nice. The Dev Diary also mentions that there are unique negative traits which might put some uh, bad mojo into your luminary, and they are tied to Empire ethics as well. Remember not to be overly tyrannical to your people, or maybe there is a hidden power in being the evil ruler. 
Or maybe that's just a trick from Marek so that we will use a Colossus on our capital planet. But seriously, he implores us not to do that. I didn't know we could do that. I didn't think we could if we can. That's definitely something I want to try doing if necessary. Last, but by no means least, it's now time to take a look at the two new tradition trees we'll be getting with Solaris Galactic Paragons. These are called Aptitude and Statecraft. The choice of the devs for themes of these tradition trees was apparently quite easy. They're going to be honest with us. They have a leader rework and new council features, and I bet you can already see where this is going. Let's start with the leader tradition tree, otherwise known as Aptitude. With the new aptitude, your empires will focus themselves on leaders, giving them bigger and smaller buffs, with an increase in experience rate being the most obvious one. It's a solid tree if one wants to focus on leaders, but if it's not your thing, then the tree is possibly best to stay away from. We'll have to see how the balance shakes out. It might be that improvements to leader level speed are much more important now than they've ever been in the game. The opener unlocks leadership conditioning, a special agenda for our empires, and reduces leader upkeep by 25%, which is nice from a unity perspective, though possibly not amazing. The finisher allows all of our leaders to get an extra starting trait, meaning all of our leaders have plus one traits, and that could be really, really powerful. As starting traits make up for a potential stronger leader by the end, they'll be able to get plus one trait in total compared to leaders without this bonus. Marek also wanted to highlight one of the perks here and that is Champions of Empire. Apparently it is the fanciest perk we can unlock from the tree. If that is the case, I'm not entirely sure this tree is really going to be that powerful, though I don't know what the spread of numbers are going to be for us in terms of how many of each of these leaders we can field. So what this will do is our admirals and generals will get plus two naval capacity. I don't actually think that's going to be very relevant unless it's a percentage modifier. Possibly we just can't notice the percentage, maybe there's a UI error. Per governor, we'll get minus 2% empire size, now that could be a bit more relevant later on, but overall probably not that important, unless we're able to stack enough governors. And then per scientist, we'll get plus 2% leader experience gain. That could be relatively useful, though again, it depends how many leaders we're going to have. We've been told we will have many fewer leaders now with the new Stellaris Galactic Paragons than we previously had, so possibly these bonuses are actually relatively minor. Now we have Statecraft, which is entirely focused on the new council mechanic. Marek would like to point out as well that here in the five pictures for this tradition, you'll notice that in four of them, someone is doing something with their hands. He petitions that the fifth picture on the top right must now include at least one hand. And I think he's onto something here. Now, it's easy to pinpoint this as council feature related, having stronger councillors and somewhat also boosting our leaders. Although if your empire is not focused on leaders, it might still profit from the non-leader oriented effects and modifiers in order for you to build up a strong government to run the show. So to sum it up, it's all about leading a state. Apparently that is quite a fitting name, I suppose. The opener unlocks a new agenda for us, Departmental Efficiency, which as yet we don't know what it does, but we know it has council related details. We'll also get a small plus 20 to our edict fund. So that's, that's not a great opener. The finisher will allow us to get plus one leader capacity. We don't know how powerful that will be, but it could be relatively useful. And plus one effective councillor skills. Now that really could be quite good. We've seen some fantastic counselor skills so far, so increasing the number that we have available to our leaders could only be a good thing. Apparently we have Carl to thank for this as he is the one that fought very hard for this modifier to be included in the next patch. This tree includes the shared benefits perk. By involving all leaders in the implementation of our agendas, they build a stronger understanding for their roles and purpose. Whenever an agenda is launched, all leaders gain 300 experience. Boosting our leaders like that, enabling them to get more skills and give us more bonuses every time we launch an agenda would be very powerful if we're able to quickly launch agenda after agenda. 
We've now seen pretty much all of the content that's going to be coming with Galactic Paragons. We've seen the new leaders, the new leader skills. We've seen the new Paragon feature with those unique leaders we can recruit in our empire. We've also seen the new civics, origins and traditions we're going to get. And I'm honestly quite excited for quite a few different parts of this. My main thought at the moment is what price point this DLC will come in at. We know the most recent DLC First Contact came in at an extra $5 or 5 euros above the regular story pack price. That's a 50% increase on previous DLC releases. I'll be interested to know whether or not Stellaris Galactic Paragons, which on the whole does seem somewhat smaller in size than Overlord or Nemesis, which we had in previous years, I'd be interested to know which price point they are putting this at. Now, there is, I think, something of a difference where even though this might be a smaller DLC, the impact of this expansion will affect all of our games at pretty much every level. We're getting a new mechanic that will be impacting everybody from day one of the game, whereas the features in Overlord or Nemesis, sometimes, especially with Nemesis and those Imperial mechanics, you might never get to in a playthrough. So even if the overall volume of content is smaller, Galactic Paragons may end up being a more essential DLC up there with something like Utopia or some of those must-buy early DLC. I have not had any early access to this DLC yet. If I do before release, I'll make sure that I put together a review video so I can let you know my thoughts on this game. It will, as ever, be biased by the fact that I absolutely love Stellaris, but I will try to be as objective as I can be for you, because regardless of the price point, if you bought First Contact and you also buy this DLC, which is basically only two months apart, you'll be purchasing DLC that costs the equivalent of the entire base game in very little time at all. Nevertheless, I'm excited, I'm happy that Stellaris is getting love and attention it deserves, and it's a real shame that this will be the first and probably last DLC from Paradox Arctic and the team up there. So far, it looks like they're doing a fantastic job with Galactic Paragons. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to know more about the new Paragons feature we have coming soon, who they are and what you can do with them, click the video on screen now.